It is a treat to be back at this amazing church. Do you love your church? Come on, do you love your church? Can you thank God for your church? Uh, it is fun to come back, and, and I have with me uh, my oldest daughter. For those of you that maybe were here when I was uh, here last, you, you maybe heard that we have six, six kids. Can you stretch your hand toward me and just pray right now? Can you just, just pray for me? Would you six kids... And, uh, and I have my oldest daughter here with me tonight, Candace. So, sweetheart, can you wave at everybody? Can you welcome my daughter, Candace? Come on, just give it up for her. I think that she really enjoys traveling with me because she gets to get away from some of the uh, madness and the chaos of the house. But it is fun to, to come. And I've been telling her about this church. And, and uh, part of my update to her was just how much I love the leadership here. And what, dear friends, I do consider several of that I've been able to get to know, but certainly Luke over the years, as he's referenced, it's been fun just to build friendship. And so, so much uh, love for him, Zach, the whole team, Pastor Jeff. And uh, I know that you already uh, have that kind of a just heart for them and, and respect and appreciation. But I hope that you just never fall into the trap of taking for granted what you have here at this church and what God has entrusted to you. Can we just thank the Lord for your pastors, your leadership? Come on, put your hands together and just thank the Lord for them. And then just fun to be here tonight because Friday night, here we are in, in, in June, Friday night, for like church on a Friday night. Like it, it, this is where the real Christians are hanging out. Like, I mean, for real, you must love Jesus to be here on a Friday night. So why don't you just turn to the person next to you and just say, God has something big for you this weekend. Just go ahead and tell them that God has something big for you. Now, why don't you turn to the other person on the other side and say, you look like you need some revival. Go ahead, just tell them that. Just say, you look like you need revival. Like you just have that look, like you could use a little bit of revival. How many of you are excited just to experience more of Jesus, for real though? You're looking forward just to more? Uh, anybody excited about going to heaven? Come on, just wave at me. Anybody excited? Oh, I'm so ready. I'm so ready for heaven. Uh, some days more than others. Is this true? Like some days, like anybody just had a week, you just had a week, you're like, you know what? This would be a great week to go to heaven. Anybody had a week like that? Few people, anybody had a month like that? Anybody had a year? You're like 2023. You're like, Lord, now would be a great time for the rapture. You're just feeling like that? And uh, tonight, I do want to just talk to you on the subject of, of heaven and specifically asking this question by way of the title is, have you thought about heaven lately? Like, has it just been on your mind lately? It's been my personal experience that the more difficulty or hardship that I face or encounter that I, I think a lot more about heaven. And I'm more excited today about it than I've ever been before. Maybe you heard that story of the, the couple that they were just tired of, of the uh, Minnesota snow and they wanted to go down to Florida for a little warm getaway. And, and you know a little bit about the, the cold winters here in Iowa as well. But for this couple that would be going down, they had two different schedules going on as the husband was going to be traveling on a work trip. So he said, I'll fly straight there and, and meet you there. The wife who couldn't come till the next day was going to fly down and, and join him the following day. And and so the husband, sure enough, got there before the wife. He got there the day before, and he checks into the hotel. And, and so he decides, well, I'll just take out my laptop, fire an email, let her know that I made it. And so he types up the email address, and when he does, he leaves out just one letter, just gets the address off. Anybody ever done that before? You just, you got close. You just missed it by a letter. And so, you know, he, he sends the email, and and it goes to a lady in Texas. This poor, grieving widow had just returned from the funeral, the homegoing celebration of her husband, a pastor who was now with the Lord, and she just finished the funeral and gets to the house, and so she thought, well, I'll open up my email and just be encouraged by the, the words from friends and family members. And so she opened it up, and she read the first email, and when she did, she passed out, and she hit the floor. 
When she did, her son came rushing into the room and found his mother on the floor, and he saw the computer screen, and it was open, and he saw the email, and he read it, and it said, to my loving wife, from your departed husband, subject, I've arrived, the message, I've just arrived and have been checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you then. P.S. It sure is hot down here. <laughs> I don't know if you've thought about heaven lately, but you might want to do that. When it comes to the subject of heaven, a lot of people have a lot of questions. People want to know about heaven. What will heaven be like? What will we do in heaven? Maybe for parents who've lost a child, will the child be waiting for me when I get to heaven? Will he be there to greet me? Will she recognize me? And some people want to know, will we have to work in heaven? Others want to know, will we eat in heaven? I have a uh, daughter who's asked me this question before, but I, I, I've had this one asked often, will my pets go to heaven? Now, in, in our family, we're, we have a dog and a cat. Who has a dog? Wave at me if you have a, a dog. Who, who has a cat? Anybody have a cat? Anybody have both? See, there's a special category for, for those who have both. So Candace, she has her dog, Charlie, and then Angel, she has the cat. And so Angel wants to know, like, will there be pets in heaven? And I've kind of changed my theology on that just a little bit because we started off with the dog, and he's such a sweet little guy, and then the cat joined us. And friends, there's not a chance in this world that that cat goes to heaven. I'm just telling you there's no way that cat is saved. There's no way. Now, Charlie, I'm still holding out. So if you're like, do pets go to heaven? Dogs, yes. Cats, no. That's the only way I know how to answer that. You may be surprised to know that the Bible really answers so many of our questions if we could just dive into it and look at it. And so for tonight, what I want to do is I really want to set the stage for what I believe will be just the beginning of what God will do over the, the next few days. And I, I want to encourage you that You've made the effort to come and to put yourself in the presence of God. And you've come, and I hope and pray with faith and expectation and anticipation for what he wants to do. And I just want to encourage you, God will not disappoint you. Not because of a speaker. We're going to allow the word of God to do the heavy lifting. and We're going to stay out of the way. But if you've come to meet with him, how many of you know that he's faithful? How many of you know that when you seek him, you will find him when you seek him with all of your heart? And so I just want to encourage you, like tonight, this is an opening, and it's meant to just to begin to step into what I believe God wants to do over the course of the next few days. You don't want to miss tomorrow night, especially for those of you that just, you feel like you could use a real victory, a real breakthrough in your life right now. Maybe you feel like your life is under attack. Perhaps your marriage is under attack. Perhaps your health is under attack. Maybe you just feel like all of hell is coming against you right now. I want you to know, I believe that the, the message the Lord has placed in my heart for tomorrow night, I believe that we will see breakthrough. We will see victory, that you will be encouraged. Your spirit's lifted, so make sure that you're back tomorrow night. But tonight, I'm excited that the Lord has, has led me to present what would be, uh, you know, we live in a world of, of uh, uh, motivational talks, right? Uh, pep talks and, and, and inspiration. Listen, there is no greater inspiration than the subject of heaven. Can you say amen to that? And as we look at this, I just want to answer a few questions tonight that I pray will be faith building to you. And, and hopefully it will stir you to not only look forward to heaven, but to allow that hope and that anticipation of heaven to impact your right here and your right now. So go ahead and talk to your neighbor again right now. Go ahead and just tell them right now, this is for you. You better get ready. Go ahead and tell them that. This is for you. You better get ready. First question that we want to answer tonight is, what is heaven like? I mean, have you ever wondered that before? 
Like, what is heaven like? Not because you saw something, you know, on Hallmark or something like that, or, you know, you, you read some poem or something like that, but what does the Bible say? Do you spend much time just wondering, like, what will it be like when we're in heaven? I mean, if we're planning to spend eternity there, Sure hope that you are, okay? If you're planning on spending eternity there, wouldn't it be appropriate just for your mind to go there from time to time? Like, have you thought about heaven lately? Like, has it crossed your mind at all? Is there any excitement about, oh, life can get hard at times, life can become difficult, but, oh, I'm headed somewhere, and won't it be wonderful there? Have you thought about heaven lately like what is heaven going to be like well to answer this we're going to be looking at multiple scriptures in the book of revelation written by john maybe you've heard him referred to as john the revelator and what he's sharing with us is his revelation uh, how god allowed him to see and to catch a glimpse of what we're all excited for and anticipating and he captures it in the book of revelation and the first thing that we learn from this revelation or this unveiling and this this uh, communication of what heaven's going to be like the first thing i'd say is it's a literal city heaven is a real place Come on, you have to move beyond just the little cartoon images, you know, or just just some um, just blissful state of mind. You have to understand that it's a literal place, and John describes it as a city. Listen to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Verse 2. He says, I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Heaven is a real place. It's a literal place. It's a prepared place for a prepared people. Maybe you've been to a beautiful city before. Who likes to travel? Anybody enjoy traveling? Come on, wave at me. You enjoy. You ever been to a city before that was just, oh, this is beautiful. Maybe you've been to a lake and you just saw just the sunrise coming up over the lake or, or for others of you, it's the sunset. You're like, I've never seen a sunrise before. Sunset and overlooking it was beautiful. Or maybe for you it was a trip to the ocean. Maybe you've been to Hawaii or, or maybe it was, it was a, a look over uh, seeing the mountains and you, you've been somewhere and it was just absolutely breathtaking. Can I tell you, no matter what you've seen, none of those cities, as beautiful as they may be, can compare with the beauty of heaven. And it's not just the beauty of heaven, but the ingenuity of that city. Revelation 21 verse 21 says, the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. Revelation chapter 22 in verse 1. We're talking about the complexity, the otherworldness, the beyond our ability to grasp state of heaven. Revelation 22 verse 1 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. John is doing the best that he can to communicate and to paint a picture. He's using the most descriptive. He's using these, it's like, he's trying to give us things that we could relate to. Have you ever been somewhere or a part of something before that it was so amazing, but then you tried to explain it to somebody else and they were just staring at you like, I don't get it. Have you ever had that happen before? Or something that's just grand, something that's just beautiful. Maybe you went to literally the Grand Canyon itself and, and you came back and you're trying to describe, and you're like, it was just, and it, it's just mm, it, big. I mean, that's the only thing that you could think of. It's like, how do I describe it, right? And you're just like, it was just, or you've tasted something before. And you're like, oh, man, it just, and, and words seem to just fall 
so short. Imagine being in John's situation and trying to describe your encounter with a picture, with a glimpse of heaven. So he's working at it. He's trying the best that he can, but it's beyond anything that we could fathom. There's a sophistication. There's an infrastructure that's so far beyond our ability to grasp. New sights, new sounds, new scenes, new music, new harmonies, new instruments, new colors, trees, rivers, lakes, vegetations, better than anything you or I could ever imagine greater than any feeling we've ever experienced, maybe the best way to sum it up is just to use the words that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in verse 9, where he said, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. What is heaven like? Here's another thought. Here's another description. What's heaven like? It's the presence of ultimate good and the absence of anything bad. Like you're just trying to get your mind around it. What's heaven like? What do we have to look forward to? What is it that we're so excited about that we should be thinking on it even today before we get there for the forever? It's the presence of ultimate good and the absence of anything bad. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. He will wipe every tear. Somebody say every tear. Come on, shout it. Say every tear. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more Pain for the old order of things has passed away. Heaven is going to be amazing. No more tears. I don't know what you're carrying, but your burden should remind you that there's coming a day when the fight will be over, the struggle gone. Come on, no more cancer, no more diabetes. No more back pain, no more migraines, no more arthritis, no more taxes. Something should be getting you excited about right now. I mean, something about heaven should excite you. That's where we're headed. That's what it's like, and we're not guessing. It's written in God's book. We will live in our glorified bodies, no longer wrecked by sin and sickness. I can't wait for my glorified body. I'm going to run. I'm going to jump. I'm going to do backflips. I'm ready for it. Anybody looking forward to that glorified body? Come on, go ahead and just tell your neighbor right now, say your six-pack is coming back. Go ahead and just tell them it's coming back. It's going to be great food in heaven. Everything's going to taste like Krispy Kreme donuts, but have the calories of a carrot. Heaven is going to be awesome. I can't wait. Do you have Krispy Kreme here? Okay. I mean, you should, then you should have said amen right there because that's what manna, literally, in the, it's the Krispy Kreme. That's what it is. I can't wait for heaven. Revelation chapter 21 verse 23 says, The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Verse 25, on no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Look at verse 27. Nothing, somebody say nothing, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful 
or deceitful. We're talking about the presence of everything good and the absence of anything bad. In heaven, there's no more fear. In heaven, there are no more dark nights. In heaven, there will be no more depression, no more abuse, no more anxiety. It is full of light, and there is no darkness nor impurity that will ever plague you again. Can you even get your mind around that? We're talking about heaven. What's it going to be like? Man, it's just so beyond our comprehension. It's just impossible to grasp. Imagine a place where it's literally all good. Every time something good happens to you here on earth, you need to let it signal to you, say, in heaven is even better. Anytime something hurtful, painful, difficult happens here on earth, you need to make sure that it reminds you that that pain has an expiration date, that that sickness will not stick to you forever, but soon and very soon, we're going to see our king. Are you excited about heaven? I'm looking forward to it. What is heaven like? Let me give you a third thing here we know from the book of Revelation. It's an eternal place. It's eternal. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5 says, there will be no more night they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. It's unending. One of the things that will make heaven heaven, certainly it's the presence of God. It's the fact that we are with him and worshiping with him, uh, worshiping him forever. But what makes that so special is that it never ends when, when we say something like, well, it's, it's going to be eternal, again, that's beyond our ability to grasp because we live in a world where things come and go. They start and they stop, but in heaven, all of the good that we've been talking about, one of the amazing truths would be that it's unending. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Paul writes, therefore, we do not lose heart. No matter what you're going through, no matter how hard your life may be or get, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And look at verse 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Did you catch just the way that Paul described troubles? For our light and our momentary troubles. I don't know about you, but there are times I'm facing stuff and I wouldn't call it light or momentary. Anybody ever had something like that come on your way? This doesn't feel light. This doesn't feel like JV difficulty. This feels overwhelming. Maybe you find yourself even at a place like that tonight. Carrying something, feeling weighed down or overwhelmed by something. So much so that at times we could feel like we're losing hope. A pain that you've been carrying and you keep waiting for the break in the clouds that never seems to come. Some days, not even feeling like you can get out of the bed. Some pain that just feels so unbearable. that you're ready to end it all. 
And yet Paul says, don't lose heart because our light troubles. And did you know that no matter what you're going through, he's talking about that as well? You say, well, how could he call this pain, this problem, this hardship light? Because it's all relative. He says, for our light and our, what was the next part? Do you remember? For our light and our momentary troubles are achieving for us what? An eternal glory, look what it says, that far outweighs them all. What we're going through, friends, it's temporary. And so here's the key, verse 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Where are you putting your eyes? Where are you putting your hope? Where are you finding your peace? Where are you trying to discover joy? How are you going about trying to experience relief from the pain? And Paul says, you won't lose heart when you understand that no matter what you're going through, it's light and it's momentary when you fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Look at this. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Temporary trials and difficulties should remind us of our eternal hope of heaven. What is seen is temporary. The pain is temporary. Your grief is temporary. Your struggles are temporary. That's why for me, Heaven is not merely a destination, it's an inspiration to me. Because there are days in my right here and my right now that I have to reach into eternity and the hope of the future. And I borrow on that and I bring it to my pain in the moment. And I remind myself what I'm going through right now, it's temporary. This does not stay forever. This does not last forever. I'm not stuck. See, one of the beautiful things about heaven is that it reminds you wherever you are, you're not stuck there forever. We can all get pretty discouraged and pretty uh, uh, hopeless if we feel like we're in a situation and there's no way out. Heaven reminds us that, no, we are moving beyond this and God is with us now, and he, we will be with him forever and ever and ever in all of eternity. When you set your mind on that, it will change your perspective of today. And I fear that part of the problem for us in the big C church is that we act like our earthly problems are actually eternal problems. Have you ever been guilty of that? We act like our earthly problems are eternal problems, and we, we act like our eternal destination is forever away instead of forever to be enjoyed. Our earthly problems seem eternal, and our eternal hope seems forever away. There's no wonder there are a lot of people who say, I tried church, I tried Christianity, and it didn't do anything. It's, Have you thought about heaven lately? And what it's really like and where we're really headed. Where you spend eternity, where you were headed to spend eternity, should affect how you live today. Well, that's a little bit of, a, of an understanding from Revelation on what heaven is going to be like. Let's answer another question here. Number two will be, what will we do in heaven? Have you ever wondered that before? What will we do in heaven. Come on, you've seen the cartoons. You're like, it, I don't know. It's something about a cloud, a harp. I don't know. I guess we just sit around. We just take turns, name that tune on the harp, you know, or my turn to play the harp, you know, or take, we just all just sing along, you know, whatever. It, what's it really going to be like? Well, one of the things that we know from Scripture is that when we get to heaven, we're going to experience our reward. We're going to be rewarded for our service. 
And this is important because a lot of times when we are trying to stay on the straight and narrow, and we're trying to honor God with our lives, and we're trying to serve God's church, and we're trying to do the right things. I, I, I don't know about you, but there are times you wonder, does anybody even notice? Come on, have you ever wondered that before? Don't leave me hanging like this up here. Come on, don't act like I'm the only unspiritual person in the room right now. You know you've done things. Does this even matter? Anybody ever see it? Like, I'm, I'm like, no joke. I'm so carnal. I'll tell you how carnal I am. When I'm taking the trash out of the kitchen, I want my whole family to know it. Can I just be real? Like, that is a true story. I just want everybody to know. Oh, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm taking the trash. I just want everybody to know. If nobody expresses appreciation, it bothers me just a little bit. It bothers me. I want to be appreciated. I want them to know. The question is, does, does, is it even worth it? Does anyone even notice? Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. It says, if anyone builds on this foundation, talking about the foundation of Christ, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day, somebody say the day, the day will bring it to light. It's talking about the day when we stand before the Lord and our lives go through the test of fire. This is a day of judgment of sorts. It's not talking about judgment in terms of a judgment of salvation. It's talking about a judgment of service. This is talking about uh, a moment of reward. Because the day will bring our life to light. It will be revealed with fire. Look what it says. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If, somebody say if, if what he has been, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if, somebody say if, if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss yet, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So this is not a, a judgment of salvation. It's a judgment of service. So even as a follower of Jesus, you know that you're going to heaven. Come on, remind me. Who's excited about heaven? Who's excited? You're looking for We're going to heaven. I can't wait. And as I stand before the Lord on that day, I'm not worried about whether or not I'm saved, whether or not my sins are forgiven, but I will still stand before him for the judgment in the sense of a judgment of service in my life. It says on that day, it's going to go through the fire, and the fire will test the quality of how I built, how I served, how I lived my life. Do you think about that ever? Like, have you thought about heaven lately and, like, what happens when we cross from here to there? Have you thought about in that moment how you're going to be rewarded based on how you serve while here on earth? Listen, heaven is going to be great for everybody, but it's not going to be the same for everybody. There will be some who their lives will go through the fire, and it says, if it's burned up, they still will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. They have nothing to show for life of service to the Lord. It's going to be great for all, but it's not going to be the same for all. Listen, I want you to know there's not a single act of kindness or generosity, not a single thing that you will ever do here on earth for God's kingdom that escapes his notice. He has seen it all. And he will reward you. That's part of what will be happening in heaven is that you will be blessed. You will be rewarded for the way that you serve your God. If you ever get tired of serving, if you ever wonder if it's worth it to write a letter to an elderly person or go visit them in a nursing home or if it's worth it to purchase a Christmas gift for a family in need, if it's, if it's worth it to get up early and come and serve in a ministry here at the church, God wants you to know that it's not only worth it, but you will be rewarded in heaven. It's one of the things that would happen in heaven. What else will we do in heaven? We will be reunited with our loved ones. I don't know how many of you in here would have stories of those who have gone ahead of you. Maybe a mom or a dad, or maybe a grandparent, a loved one who they stepped into eternity before you and the grief was so real, it was so heavy, it was so hard. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17 says, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be, we all will be with the Lord forever. I love verse 18, therefore encourage one another with these words. I wanted to encourage you with those words. I mean, you can't preach on heaven without it just being a message of hope and encouragement. At a fresh wind conference, everything that we could talk about will ultimately point to that time when we're all together with God forever. And while here, experiencing some pain and grief as it relates to loss, I want to encourage you with these words. We grieve, yes. We lose friends and family members, yes. But we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We will see them again. And this time around, it will be for good. And sometimes people ask, do you think that we'll recognize one another? And I believe that we will. You know what Scripture teaches is that we know here on earth in part, but ultimately we will know fully we'll understand God more so we'll understand things about even life that right now are impossible for us to understand I will say this I believe that when we get to heaven we're going to be smarter not dumber anybody think that's theologically sound I believe that we'll be reunited with friends and family members and there's going to be no more separation. Maybe you've had to say goodbye to someone who's moved away or gone into the military or even as it relates to them passing away, but we will all be reunited together forever in heaven, and there are only highs, no more goodbyes. I'm looking forward to that. What will we do in heaven? We'll be reunited with our loved ones, and then here's one for you. We will forever worship our amazing God. We will forever worship our amazing God. Um, I don't know exactly how it's going to work. Um, I like to just imagine sometimes. I know that my imagination is limited. And I know that I cannot fully understand, even with the great lengths that John the Revelator went to to help paint a picture for me, I don't know exactly what it's going to be like. But when I read my Bible, there are some certain stories that when I read them, I just think I would love just when I get to heaven, I'd love just to pop that DVD in and just catch that scene right there just to see what really went on. Wouldn't that be cool? Like there's just some big, big screen, you know, in the, in just a big, you could just sit down. Oh, okay. So that Shadrach, Meshach, okay. Okay. Like, wouldn't that be, do you have some Bible stories like that? You just love to know how did that whole thing go down? I mean, I'd love to be able to talk to David and be like, bro, for real, come on, you know, you were scared a little bit. I mean, I'd love just to have some conversations. You know, I just love, Moses, was it like, let my people go? Or was it more like, please? You know, like, what were you really feeling in the moment? I'd love to have some conversations. But ultimately, what I'm looking forward to is when I think about the one who died so that I could live. The one who left the splendor and the glory of heaven and came to this sin-cursed world so that when I leave this sin-cursed world, I can spend forever with him in heaven. And I just can't wait to look into his face and his eyes and say, thank you, Jesus. Not just for saving me. Anybody with me? I want to say thank you for not giving up on me. Anybody else looking forward to that communication? Thanks for not throwing in the towel on me. Thanks for your faithfulness. Thanks for your unconditional love. Thank you for your grace that's greater than all of my sin. Thank you, Jesus. 
I can't wait to be with him. I can't wait to worship him. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6 says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. What a description. What a picture. Like that's what it's going to be like. An eternal worship service. And some of you hear that and you're like, doesn't sound like heaven to me. And here's why. Because you've been a part of a worship service, a church service, not at this church, but another church. And after a few songs, you just thought, man, if I don't sit down, man, my dogs are barking, my knees are aching. If I don't sit down, oh, they went into another song. Oh, dear Jesus, just take me right now. You've been a part of some services to where you thought, if they turn this thing around one more time, I'm going to lose my mind. You've been a part of some worship services that you thought were eternal. And you just thought, I'm about to lose my mind. You felt like that before. So when you hear, in heaven, we're going to worship God forever. You're like, oh. <laughs> but there are others of you, you've been a part of a worship moment to where you are so caught up in the presence of the Lord to where you became oblivious to everything else that was going on around you? Have you ever had this happen before? You were overwhelmed by the presence of God? There was this undeniable peace that passes all understanding that just washed all over you. This joy that was unspeakable and it was full of the glory of God. Just you were worshiping God and it just seemed like it just was there. It's just so fast. And you look and realize, man, we worship for 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. And you're like, man, it just went by so fast. Like, for real, I'm being for real, so don't get caught up in the hype and Christian peer pressure. But, like, for real, wave at me if you know what I'm talking about. Come on, right now, you say, you've had a moment just in the presence of the Lord. Come on again, raise your hand, just keep it up and look around. There are people in this room who will testify, they say, just a moment in the presence of God. And you get caught up. And it's greater than anything that you could communicate or describe. And as John is communicating it here, I just love the descriptions and the imagery. I mean, it's like this thunderous, this clapping. Uh, it's just like this overwhelming sense of joy and jubilation. I know it's, it's hard for us to understand, but just trying to step into it. It's like beyond our ability to grasp how good it is. You're just caught up in the presence of our holy God. And you're saying, thank you, best you know how. But you realize it wasn't good enough, so you try it again. Thank you, and it's not good enough. And so you try again, and you're like, you're awesome. Ah, that didn't quite do it. Ah, I like you. Ah, I'm still trying. And you continue just out of excitement to communicate your love for him. Maybe you've been at a sporting game. I don't know if you're into sports. I don't know if you're into athletics, but you've been there. Your team was losing. It was down to the final two seconds and somehow half-court shot. No, let's make it a full-court shot. Throws it the whole length of the place, and it, the buzzer sounds while the ball is in the air. There's not a chance. It's over. You're going to lose, and you know it. Somehow, some way, it goes through the hoop. You win. You go crazy. You remember just that moment where instantly everybody... You ever been in an atmosphere like that? You might call it electric. Uh, people are like, pandemonium. Oh, it was crazy. That does not even come close to what John is communicating right here. He's like, we're going to get there. Everybody will jump to their feet. Oh, God. Oh, God, you're so awesome. Oh, God, I knew that you were good. But now that I'm here, mm -mm -mm, God, you're good. And we will be worshiping along with all of the angels singing, great are you, God. You're so awesome. Worship team, can you come and get in place? Because I think we might ought to worship. As a foretaste of what God has for us. 
You will thank Him. You will praise Him. You will adore Him. You will exalt Him. You will worship Him forever. And you will never grow tired of it. You will be so energized by it because of His goodness. His majesty will stand in awe. There are times that certain songs kind of just hit you just right. You know, I mean, we can worship God without a worship team. We can worship God without, you know, songs that have great bridges or just the right key change. Like, we can worship God anywhere, everywhere, anytime, all the time. Every now and then, there's a, a worship course that just hits you just right, like right where you are in life. And it helps you to express something to God that you feel deeply. And it causes you just to resonate with that and kind of, I don't know, it's just easier to enter in. It's just, there just seems to be a grace on it, like the, the wind at your back ushering you into the presence of the Lord. And that's the way it will be all time for eternity. Unhindered. You never get tired. Because even the most spiritual in the room, you know, after a little bit, some of you, you had both hands up. You're like, man, that right arm, you know, Lord, you understand. It's that bad shoulder I got, you know. So you still got one going on. After a little while, you're like, Lord, I'm just going to praise you being seated here for just a minute. Lord, in your presence, it's going to sit down. But... We're in the presence of the Lord. We will worship Him forever and ever and ever and ever, never grow tired and never lose motivation. What a powerful picture. The last question I just want to answer before we worship the Lord is, who's going to heaven? Like, what does the Bible say about who's going to heaven? Because I found it interesting that an ABC News survey <laughs> revealed that 85% of people who believe in heaven believe that they're actually going there. And that's interesting because Matthew chapter 7 teaches us that the masses take the wide road And the few take the straight and narrow. It teaches us that there are many people who think they're going to heaven and they're actually not. Like that's scripture. It says in Matthew 7, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And Jesus says, and I'll respond, depart from me, I never knew you. Sad reality is there are a lot of people in churches playing a church game, a religious game, really close. But they won't spend forever in heaven. If we were to play out like this little uh, hypothetical situation here to where tonight at the conclusion of this service, when it's over, we all just step into eternity. I don't know exactly how the check-in system is going to work. John didn't capture that part. I don't know exactly how that's going to play out there in the moment, but let's just say that there's the gate, there's an angel, and he's got a clipboard. Now let's call it an iPad just to feel a little more modern. He's got an iPad. What would you say in that moment as to why? you feel like you're going to be allowed into heaven. And a lot of people would say, well, because I believe in God. And the book of James would say, good. Even the demons believe in God and they tremble. 
So believing in God's not who goes to heaven. Some people would say, because I'm a pretty good person, uh, I do some good things. Um, some would even say part of that is like I, I go to church. Some would say I give in the offering. Some may even say I, I serve at my church from time to time. And those are really cool things. But it's not what gets somebody into heaven. So you can actually believe in God. You can actually do good deeds and still not enter in. But John captures in verse 27 of chapter 21 in Revelation, nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. Nothing is a pretty strong word. Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nothing. So no one who's ever done anything impure will enter into heaven. Anything shameful, deceitful, impure, nothing will enter into heaven. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So who goes to heaven? People whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Which leads us to the very important question, how do I get my name in that book? And there are a lot of religious answers to that or approaches to that. But I'm telling you, friend, if you don't base your understanding and your approach on God's holy word, it doesn't matter how nice it sounds or how spiritual it sounds, there's only one way to heaven. And it's through Jesus Christ the Son of the living God, by you confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Very important to understand the word Lord and His Lordship. Confessing and declaring with your life, I'm dead to me. I'm surrendered to you. You don't have some of me, you don't have most of me, you have all of me. Lordship, confessing that he is king, that he calls the shots. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross to follow me. If you're not willing to give up everything, you're not worthy of being my disciple. Whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Those who have come and confessed with their mouth, Lord, I surrender all. And you give your everything. And you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. You live your life with that resurrection power in you and driving you while here on this earth. If you find yourself playing religious games, having a head knowledge of Christianity, but if you are gut level honest, acknowledging you're not surrendered to him, my question is, what makes you think your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How would you answer it? I know as I'm saying that, there would be some who'd say, Scotty, are you trying to, are you trying to make me doubt my salvation? Are you trying to talk me out of thinking I'm right with God? No. And I would say this, if I can talk you out of your walk with God, what kind of walk with God do you have if you want to let somebody come up here and talk about, no, maybe you're not. 
because Romans chapter 8 says this that when the Spirit of God lives in you his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God all of us at times doubt like man what about the Bible out of questions we have to wrestle those down and work through it but don't you think that <clears throat> that your soul's eternity is worth wrestling that down those of us who would question our salvation so what do you do when you have questions what does the Bible say about how to get our names written in the Lamb's book of life so tonight as we pray and as we worship the Lord I'm going to begin with just an opportunity for those who have been here tonight and say you know what I want to know that I know that I know I've surrendered my everything to God. Maybe at one point you were walking with God. Life has happened. Distractions have come. Maybe you've grown cold. Maybe you've become complacent. Maybe lukewarm. Maybe you've strayed. To me, the, the issue is not me coming to say you were saved, but now you're not, or you never were, and this is the first time. The issue is to say tonight, on the beginning of a wonderful weekend, should Jesus tarry, this night he's giving you this opportunity to know that a place as amazing as heaven is, as stated in Scripture, is a prepared place for a prepared people, and He wants you there. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm going to pray here in just a moment. And what I just ask you to do is just to search your heart here in the presence of the Lord. And if you're not right with God... Don't allow the most important decision that you will ever make to slip by you. Don't tune it out. Don't push it off. This is for anyone and everyone who would just say, hey, tonight is the night that I want to commit or recommit my life to Christ. I want to spend forever in heaven instead of hell. I want to receive God's free gift of grace. I want a fresh start. I want a clean slate. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want you to know that it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've ever done. It's not by chance that you are here tonight. God brought you to this place because he wants to change you from the inside out. He wants to have such a transformation to where using the words of Scripture is like you are born all over again. So I'm going to pray in just a moment. But if God is knocking on the door of your heart, just know he's pursuing you with his love and his grace. Don't miss this. So for those of you who would say, Scotty, I'm not right with God, but I want to be. I want to commit or I want to recommit my life to Christ. I want to make him my Lord, my King, my Master, my everything. I want to just surrender 100%. No more playing games. No more holding back. No more one foot in and one foot out. Tonight is the night that I will declare I have decided to follow Jesus. In just a moment, if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to lift up your hand just long enough for me to see it. And by doing that, you're just declaring, yep, that's me. And tonight, I'm making that choice. I'm making that decision. Don't worry about anything else. Don't worry about anyone else. This is the most important and biggest decision that you will ever make. If God's love is pursuing you right now, you know it. He's knocking on the door of your heart. Don't blow it off. I'm going to pray. So for those of you who just say, hey, that's me. I need that. Scotty, include me in that prayer. Tonight, I want to follow Jesus. Come on, without hesitation, all over the room, just slip up your hand. Come on, right now, just say, yeah, that's me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Anybody else? Okay, you can put your hand down. You can put your hand down. Anybody else before we pray? Just lift it up. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. I, I want to take just a moment. Head still bowed and eyes still closed. I just want to, I want to lead you in how to just take this step. I'm going to lead you just in this moment of surrender. So it's not that it's my words or this magical prayer that brings about a change. I'm just guiding you here in this moment. I just want you to say to him, God, please forgive me of my sin. And just right there where you are, just say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Come into my heart. 
and just tell him from this moment forward I've decided I want to follow you with my everything would you just take just a moment to say that and to mean that mean it with all of your heart Lord I just pray for every person who just raised their hand Lord that this would be a night that marks the shift and the change that this would be the night Lord that they turn their backs on the things of this world and they follow hard after you and I pray that even right now as they pray that and mean that Lord that you would change them God that you would fill them with your life with your light with your goodness I pray it, Lord, in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. You know, the Bible says when one person surrenders their life to Christ, that there's a celebration in the presence of God. How many of you are thankful tonight for people who said yes to Jesus? Come on, can we thank Him and praise Him? Thank you, Lord. Hey, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet, if you would, please, and I'm not going to keep you for a a super long time. As a matter of fact, after I lead us into this time where we'll just be worshiping, I'll I'll step off and one of the pastors is going to come and we'll direct just the closing of our night. But I told you at the beginning, tonight was the beginning of how this is going to build. Please don't miss tomorrow night if you're able to be here. I just, in my heart, I really believe that God's going to do some wonderful things, some powerful things in our lives. I believe that we're going to see breakthrough. But tonight, before we worship the Lord, I just wonder if you've thought about heaven lately. Has the thought of heaven come in and steadied you in the midst of your storm that you may be walking through right now? Has the hope of heaven come in and been just like a medicine a soothing balm on your life right now for pain that's very real but your hope of the healing from the God who rules and reigns is ministering to you not one day not someday but right here and right now where are your eyes where's your heart where's your mind since then you've been raised with Christ set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Some of you are battling so much just emotional and mental strain and stress because of the craziness of our world. It's like you haven't read the end of the book. How many of you tonight are thankful that you know how it all ends? Come on, you know how the story ends. We will win. We will be victorious. So we play from victory. And so tonight, some of you just needed to be reminded of that. So my call to action would be for those of you that would be willing to say, tonight, I commit to setting my mind on things above. And allowing here, just in this closing time where I believe God can touch hearts even right now, there can be some healing. There can just be some some ministering done to your heart, to your emotions, to your mental health, to your mind, as you're, you're reminded of the fact that the God of all eternity, the God of heaven, is here with you right here and right now tonight. That God can do that. So I'm just going to ask this first part would be any who would say, you know what? I just need that. I need the God of heaven to meet with me right here tonight. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up? Come on, just say, I need a meeting with the king tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome, 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 awesome. We're going to enter into his presence. There are others of you. You just need, you need God to remind you tonight. You're just saying, God, are you really with me? are you and you just need God to remind you I've got you I'm with you I've got you I just believe that tonight we can take off that spirit of heaviness and we can put on a garment of praise that as we begin to worship the Lord as the presence of God begins to fill this room and move on your heart that there can be a supernatural just transaction. 
And you can walk out of this place tonight with all of those burdens placed at the feet of Jesus. And you walk out with the joy of the Lord as your strength. I'm going to ask if you would, please, would you be willing to step out? Everyone, just step out from where you are and come close to the altar. Would you do that? Come on, just move from where you are. We're just going to come together as a, as a church family just to enter into the presence of the Lord. And we're just going to worship God together here. And in just a minute, what we'll do, Scott, is we'll just sing uh, Great Are You, Lord, here in just a minute. But I just want to pray over just the church family. Come on, if you would, just come in close. And if you need a little space, that's okay. But maybe just shift to the side one way or the other so that people can get in from, from the aisles there. So one thing I'm asking you just to commit to the Lord. Lord, I will set my mind on things above. I'm going to quit being so anxious about the stuff of this world. It might even help if I spent a little more time with my mind and my eyes in his book rather than in the news. Worried about all that's going on with the craziness and the chaos of this life. Lord, I'm reminded tonight that I need to set my heart on things above. I just need to be reminded by that. And ask God tonight to help us to live with an eternal perspective that you will view today in light of eternity. That will affect the way you view those who are unkind to you, those who are away from Christ, those who are, let's just say it this way, they are excelling and showing their humanity, okay? So as they are excelling and showing their humanity, but you're seeing that situation through the lens of eternity. You're seeing the right here and the right now for what it is. You realize it's not so much that I need to be heard or offended or playing the victim role as much as I realize I'm on assignment from the Lord because my hope is set on eternity and I'm not there yet because God has me right here, right now. This must be a ministry moment. This must be an opportunity where God's wanted me to love that person and to show them you want to live your life with your hearts and minds set on eternity, so much so to where people who would want to criticize or, or who would want to mock Christianity, listen, don't be offended when people who are away from Christ act an awful lot like people who are away from Christ. Like, don't, that, don't let that bother you. Don't let it get under your skin to where now you're getting caught up in the wrong fight. When you are living for eternity, you will be broken by what's going on around you and you will be anchored to your hope of eternity. Live in such a way as to where people are looking at you and they're going, what are you looking at? How are you so different? Your mind is set on things above. Your heart is set on things above. Live in such a way. Let me ask it to you this way. Is your life smiling? Is it smiling? Are we just as in despair? We're just as broken as people who have no hope of eternity. We're just right there. We're miserable, unhappy, discontented at work, mad at my wife, mad at my husband, sick of these kids, can't pay my bills. And I'd like for you to have the same Jesus that I do. Are you interested? How many of the world's going, no thanks? It's because we've lost sight of what this is, where we're headed, where all of this ends up, where we're going. I see today differently in light of eternity. Some of us need to borrow that and bring it into the moment. But can we, in the presence of the Lord right now, just ask, Oh God, help me to live in light of eternity. Paul's not calling your pain and your heart and your difficulty light to be insulting. He's just reminding you it's all relative. This light and this momentary. Light and momentary is achieving something. The glory of God in your life, both now and forevermore, that far outweighs them all. What if we allowed heaven to invade our hearts right here, right now, tonight? So I'm going to pray for you. Would you just lift your hands toward heaven? I just want to pray over you right now. 
Lord, I do know that there are some who just have a spirit of heaviness or the enemy is just all over them and trying to discourage them. Lord, would you please be with them and help them to cast their cares on you? Lord, I pray for those who've become so engrossed just with the cares of this world that they've lost sight of the hope of heaven. Tonight, Lord, would just through the teaching of your word, through that truth that we've looked at tonight, would you remind them that it will be worth it all and that soon and very soon we're going to be with you? Would you remind them, Lord, that where we're headed for eternity needs to affect today the way we parent, the way we love and serve our spouse, the way we serve in our church, the way we handle ourselves at, at work and school. Lord, would you just remind us that we're on assignment and that we're on a mission. Lord, would you remind us of that? And God, I just ask that you would open the floodgates of heaven and that you would pour out on us here in this place as we worship you tonight, declaring your greatness, declaring your goodness. Lord, would you let heaven come and flood our hearts in the strong and the mighty name of Jesus. Now, would you just take about 30 seconds to, in your own way, just communicate how much you love him, how much you adore him. Come on, just your own word. Would you just tell him right now? Come on, he inhabits the praises of his people. Come on, God is enthroned on the praises of his people. He shows up in special ways and in unique ways when you begin to step into his presence by thanking him, acknowledging him, putting your eyes on him. Come on, we'll just, we'll, we're going to worship him in just a minute. In just a minute, we'll start at the beginning of that song in just a minute. And then we're going to move into the chorus and we're going to worship the Lord in just a minute. But right now, you just worship him in your own way. Come on, right now, just communicate your love to him in your own words. Come on, would you thank him right now for saving your soul? Come on, just tell him that. Would you just thank him right now for his grace that's greater than all of your sin? Come on, would you just thank him right now for not giving up on you? Come on, would you just thank him right now for being your strength when you are weak? Would you just thank him? Would you just praise him? Come on, would you thank him right now for the hope of eternity? Would you thank him right now that we're headed to heaven and soon and very soon we're going to be with him and it will be worth it all. Just tell him thank you. Just tell him how much you love him. Just tell him how grateful you are. For Come on, he's worthy of your praise. He deserves it. The very best that we can do is the very least that we can do. It should be our very best offering of praise. Our highest thanks. Our highest gratitude. That we just love him and we praise him and we adore him. Come on, take a minute to press beyond just comfort or convenience and love on him. Practice His presence and worship Him. God, You're great. God, You're awesome. Oh, God, You're holy. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all of the earth. We glorify Your name in all of the earth. How great You are, Lord. How great You are, Lord. Just worship Him. Come on, lift Him up right now with the presence. 